Good afternoon, everyone. Before I even get into the slides, let me just try to paint a picture. Stress is very difficult for us to visualize. You can't see it, of course. It's there inside a material whenever you put a load on it of any sort. In fact, just sitting there, its own weight is a load. So there's always some stresses in the material. In fact, there's even locked-in stresses that are put there when it's manufactured. So even if you put it on a velvet pillow so that you know its weight wasn't a factor, there's still stresses in it, typically. Now, stress is analogous to pressure in a very loose sense. And you, I think you all have a, an intuitive feel for pressure. You know, you blow up a balloon, it gets bigger. And we know that the, according to the gas law theories, the pressure is uniform in all directions, right? So if I have, if I take a Coke can, this would be a stupid thing to do, and I put it on some source of heat. It's a sealed can. I start to heat the Coke up. There's not much air in the can, right? And so the thermal energy going in is going to expand the liquid. It's going to start pressing on the can. And it's going to press on the inside of the can uniformly in all directions, right? That's the, the uh, theory of pressure. Well, stress is like pressure. It's the same units. PSI or uh, megapascals is the, the two most common units used. But it's very, very different in one respect in that it is nowhere near uniform in all directions because it exists in a solid material. And the solid material can resist differently in different directions in some cases. And just the application of loads don't cause there to be a balloon-like uniform pressure, quote unquote, stress inside the part. So one of the most difficult things to, to understand when you start to try to calculate these things is what direction are the stresses in, and how do they affect the material in that direction? And we'll spend a lot of time discussing that sort of thing. So if you, if you can put this metal image up that I'm trying to describe of, yeah, there's pressure of a sort, we call it stress, inside a solid material when I put a load on it. And that pressure is going to be pushing outward or inward, could be either, on little infinitesimal particles of the material. And literally, I can have a different amount of stress on adjacent particles. So it's distributed continuously throughout the continuum of the material. And it's varying continuously throughout the continuum of the material in magnitude and direction both. Okay. So this is a, a very, very simple example here. How I load it makes a big difference in how the stresses get distributed within the material. So this is a very simplistic case in which I take some kind of a bar of uniform cross-section is shown rectangular here, could be anything. And by some magic, I pull on the ends. It doesn't show how I grab it to pull. This, this is a magic drawing. So I just somehow pull on those two ends. So I'm stretching it, which of course is called tension. And if I'm somehow able to make that pull be uniform across the faces, like magic again, okay, then we postulate and can show that within the material, you have a uniform distribution of stress in the direction of pull, which is represented by this bunch of arrows on the cut face right here. Okay? But again, the stress exists really at a point down inside the material. So we can't really look at the whole chunk. We have to get out a microscope and look down inside of it. And what we typically do is represent various bits and pieces inside of it as a little dinky cube. Now, that cube theoretically has zero dimension. But we're going to give it some dimension to be able to visualize it, OK? And that cube, of course, has six faces. And we represent the stresses as being applied to the faces, either to squish them or stretch them. That's shown as stretching those two faces. So again, if I were able to, if I had the magic, I could sort of grab these two surfaces and pull this way, right? And I would be putting uniform distributed stresses across the cross section. And we call those normal stresses because they are normal to the surface. Now, stresses can be either three-dimensional or two-dimensional in nature. They're truly always three-dimensional, but sometimes the third-dimensional stress becomes zero. And then we say, well, it's a 2D case, because I've got a zero third, third value. So let's look at the 2D case first, because it's much simpler. And it, luckily, it turns out that a very large fraction of the 
practical cases we encounter as mechanical engineers can be represented as a 2D stress state. There's a whole bunch of exceptions to that, which we'll address in due time. But the 2D state is common enough that it's worth studying in itself. So we have here, I'm looking at the cube end on now. It's still a cube, but I'm just looking at the face. So your view is now that, and you can't see the sides. But they're still there. So the arrows that are depicted here and labeled sigma xx on both sides are on those faces that you can't see. And they're pulling out on the cube. And do I show any pushing? No, I got them pulling out on the other face also. Okay. And we label those uh, in an xy plane, of course. So if the stress is pulling in the y direction, no surprise, it's called y. The first y says, I'm acting on the y face. And the second Y says I'm pulling in the Y direction. And I really don't have a lot of choice in this particular case, because I can either pull or push, but the definition of this stress is normal to the surface. So it's always going to be in the direction of, that the face is on. Okay? So this is pulling on the X face in the X direction. We call it sigma XX. Now also present, possibly, are other stresses called shear stresses. So we really have two flavors, normal and shear. That's the, that's the whole story. I have here a representation of a stress cube. It's made of foam rubber, so I can manipulate it. And I've got a little axis system here. I'm going to define the horizontal axis as x, the vertical as y, and the one coming toward you is z. So that means that this is the x plus face of the cube, and this is the x minus face of the cube. And likewise, y plus on the top, y minus on the bottom, z plus on the front, and z minus on the back. Now, we can have normal stresses on this stress cube, as you know, and we can also have shear stresses, and I'll show you both. So these represent arrows, and the best I could do for arrowheads and Tinker Toy were these little orange things. So these represent normal stresses that are pulling on the faces of that cube in the positive and negative x direction. So we call these sigma xx, and the two subscripts denote the fact that it's acting on the x face in the x direction. Now one of them is, of course, going in the negative x direction, but it's acting on the negative x face. And if those two signs are the same, it's considered a positive vector. So these are both positive stresses. Now if I turn them around and have the arrowheads in, now they are compressive or negative. Because now, on this side, I have a negative going x direction on the positive x face. The signs are different, thus it's a negative stress. Likewise, I'm on the negative x face, but I'm pushing in the positive x direction. The signs are different, therefore that's a negative stress. So negative stress is considered compressive. And with my hands, I can demonstrate, if I'm strong enough, that if I push on that, I compress the cube, and you can see it getting smaller in dimension more difficult for me to stretch it because I don't have a real good grip on this thing, but if I could pull that more uh, vigorously than I'm able to, you would see the foam would increase in dimension across the x direction. So tensile pulls it out, compressive squashes it in. Now we also, as you should know, can have what are called shear stresses. And these come in pairs that form a couple. So if I have a stress that's lay, lying on the side of that cube on the x face and pointing in the y direction, we call that tau, for shear stress, xy. It's on the x face in the y direction. And this one on the other side is also on the x face in the y direction. It happens to be going negative. But again, this is on the negative x face in the negative direction, and this is on the positive x face in the positive direction on my left hand over here. And these two provide a couple. And that couple is trying to distort this cube. I'll try to do that with my hands. This is going to be pushing down, and this is going to be pushing up. And you can see that that cube is turning into a rhomboid. And if I had the stresses going the other way, it would shear it in the other direction. So the shear stresses indicate that I am distorting or changing the shape of the cube as opposed to just elongating it or compressing it as I would with the normal stresses. Now, in order to have equilibrium, if I have a tau xy over here and its mate tau xy over there, 
I also have to have a tau yx that's acting on the, on the y face in the x direction and its companion, the other half of the couple, on the bottom y face in the x direction. Now, I don't have enough hands to put all of these on at the same time, but if I show these two, you can see that those will counteract one another. In other words, this one's trying to shear it this way and this one's trying to shear it this way. So with the two pairs, this gives me from your side a counterclockwise couple and this gives me from your side a clockwise couple. And those two counteract one another to put the cube in equilibrium. Now, in the case of the normal stresses that I talked about first, the sigma xx and the sigma yy, if we're up top, here's a yy, there's a zz, uh, we typically drop the second subscript when we write these because they're always in pairs of the same subscript. That is, you, you'll never have a sigma xy. We reserve tau for the stresses that are combined between the axes and thus our shear stresses. So sigma implies a normal stress and we shorten it to sigma x, sigma y, or sigma z. Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint now. So the convention in mechanical engineering is to use the Greek letter sigma for normal stresses, the Greek letter tau for shear stresses, and you will find that that notation is different in other disciplines. Physics we may use something different. Materials people may use something different. Sometimes they call them all sigma. I think it's useful from a mechanical engineering perspective to use different symbols because we have to handle them differently in the calculations. So when you see a sigma, you know that's a stress normal to some surface. It may not be the surface that you are pulling on because there's an infinity of those cubes, right? I can cut a cube in any orientation I want at a point. And really the cube has no dimension. Let's look at these tau arrows. So tau xy and tau xy on the other side are a pair of shear stresses. So that's my doing this to the cube, okay? And the notation there is the same idea. The first letter says the face I'm acting on. I'm, I'm pushing on the x face in the y direction. So it's face direction, face direction, okay? So here I'm pushing on an x face in the y direction x face in the y direction. One is positive, one is negative, right? And that creates a couple, does it not? If I have a pair of forces equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, and separated by some distance, that creates a moment, right? So the moment of the couple. And so I'm taking that and knocking into a cocked hat. I'm trying to shear that little cube, okay? Now, for equilibrium, I have to have some counter forces that keep it from moving. Because this thing doesn't move when it gets stressed unless we break it, and we don't want to do that. So up to the point that we break the thing, the stresses are just in there, and they're fighting one another. So I have to have another pair of taus, yx this time, acting on the y face in the x direction, yx with the opposite sign, y face x direction, that are top and bottom that are a counter couple. Notice that they give me a couple in the other direction. So I'm trying to shear it this way with these two sides, and I'm trying to shear it the other way with the other two sides, and that puts it in equilibrium, okay? So we can show through mathematical manipulation that in all cases, tau xy is gonna be equal to tau yx in magnitude. They're countering one another, okay? Getting more complicated. Now we got 3D. So we got the z direction coming into the mix, but it's just more of the same stuff. So now I can have tau xz, that really should be closer to the tau, I'm not sure what happened to it. We have tau zx and tau xz, and we have, uh, they're not shown on the back side because it gets too busy, a tau yx and a tau xy, somewhere here, right there, going up that way. Not all the possible components are shown. Now there, are, there end up being nine components of stress here and those nine components comprise what is called the stress tensor. But because we have these equilibrium conditions, we can get the nine down to six. So here's the picture of the so-called stress tensor, okay? Mr. Cauchy was a mathematician. So we can represent all nine possible stress components, and think of these as components, that are acting on one little infinitesimal point, which is our magic cube, 
with this matrix, sigma XX, sigma YY, and sigma ZZ are the normal stresses. They occur on the diagonal. They have the same subscripts. Notice that the subscripts are just row column. So the first, again, the first is face, the second is direction. So sigma XX is acting on the X face and the X direction, Y on the Y, y direction. The first row has the first subscript always x. The second row has the first subscript always y. The third one is z. And going down the columns, you've got the x's in the first column, the y's in the second, and the z's in the third. So it's a very sensible arrangement. Okay? And because of those e e uh, equalities I just had up there, we can chuck some of these because they're equal to one another and get it down to six. Okay? But that's the complete tensor. Now, we're pretty much forced to carry along with us in our notation, the double subscript for the taus, because the sub subscripts are not always the same. You've got an xy, you've got an xz, you've got a zy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're stuck with double subscripts. But notice that the sigmas always have twin subscripts. So being lazy, we don't bother to write the two of them. So we write sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, but it's understood that they are sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma zz, just to save some writing time. Okay. So here's a little uh, example of how we figure out the signs. So here I put some um, unit vector notations on here. So we'll call this direction the i hat, the j hat, and the k hat to get our three dimensions in there. And as is usual, you, i goes with x, and j goes with y, and k goes with z. That's usually the way it's done, though it doesn't really matter. And so this shows an example in which all the components that I, I happen to show on there, and of course I don't have them all, uh, some on the back sides as well, on the bottom that I don't show, those are all positive. Now how do we define positive? Well, call these guys over here the surface normal vectors. And normal vectors of, of a surface are defined in geometry as being positive outward from the surface, okay? negative in. So that means that this is a positive stress, positive stress, positive stress. These are pointing in. Those are negative, negative, negative. These are tensile. They're pulling. These are compressive. They're pushing. So that leads to the standard sign convention that tensile stresses are positive, compressive stresses are negative. Okay? There's nothing um, magic about that. It's just a sign convention. But they're obviously opposite. And the shears are defined as positive if the shear, the shear arrow, if you will, uh, is on the positive surface, positive face, in the positive direction. Does that make sense? So that's positive z upward, right? So that's a positive shear stress because it's on the positive y surface and it's in the positive z direction. This guy, on the other hand, is on the positive z surface, but on the, in the negative y direction. So if the signs match, it's positive. And if the signs don't match, it's negative. That's the convention for the shear stress. Does that make sense? Now I've got to differentiate now with some other adjectives on the stresses. If I grab this cube, and I do this to it, and I invite you up here to do something else to it, and you know, I have, I've got enough hands to do it all, and you do that, and somebody else does this, and somebody else does this, and somebody else does that. We've got a whole bunch of stresses applied to this. And we can have real situations in which we have multiple stresses applied at the same point. That's common. We're going to pick the directions in which we calculate the stresses based on our convenience. You know, our part has some obvious dimensions. It's got a long axis. We may call that z. It's got a cross axis. We'll call it x. We'll call the other guy y. And those directions mean something to us from a physical standpoint with respect to the part. But the stresses don't care what axes we pick. The stresses are going to do their own thing anyway. So if I apply stresses in the what I'm going to call the x and the y and the z directions, that does not mean that the largest values of stress are going to end up being in that, those directions inside my little cube. Because again, the stresses can vary in magnitude 
all over the place, not like pressure in a balloon. Okay? So we have two sets of stresses that we have to deal with in this order. I figure out what my applied stresses are, much more about that later, and I can calculate those. I have equations for those, you know, tensile stress is just force over area, PSI. Um, bending's more complicated, torsion more so too. We'll deal with all that in good time. But I'm going to apply some set of stresses. As a result of that set of stresses, I'm going to create, I like the word induce, I'm going to induce other stresses in the part at this point, and some, some of those other stresses are going to be the biggest, not necessarily the ones that I'm putting on. They, I could end up with a bigger stress in a different direction than I'm happen, happening to be pushing. This will happen not if I only have one push, but the combination of all the pushes. That geometry can give me a stress in a different direction. Those largest values are called the principal stresses. And that's what we're after as our first step, because we want to know what's the largest stress in this thing to compare against the strength to see if it breaks, right? So just using what stresses we're applying is not sufficient. We have to figure out what the principal stresses are. And this little example attempts to show how that works. So here's my cube in which I have applied some collection of stuff. And it's, again, a 2D case to keep it simple. And I'm choosing the xy axis to make myself happy, because it means something to the part. But I'm now going to, we're going to, in a moment, get into some messy equations from which I can calculate the values of these other sigmas that have these number labels, sigma 1, 2, and 3. Those are called the principal stresses. And they're defined as being the largest stresses of a normal variety. We'll also have some larger shear stresses. But for the moment, let's talk about principal stresses. So these are the largest particular normal stresses that we have due to this loading. And they will be in some direction other than, possibly, in some direction other than I'm pushing, okay? i.e. not x and y. And so they're going to be on what are called the principal axes. And the principal axes will end up being uh, rotated by some angle shown here as phi, which we can calculate if we wish. And I'm interested in knowing what these values are to compare to the strength of my material. Okay? So we've got to have a way of calculating those. That's called the transformation or rotation angle. Now, the other thing that's unique about these so-called principal normal stresses is the planes on which they sit, which are at this cockeyed angle, have zero shear stress. So on these particular planes, or these directions, I have pure normal stress, no shear. The shear exists on different planes. Again, you have to think of this, this cube as being a dot in reality. And on different orientations around the dot, we're saying it as a cube for visualization purposes, I can have things pushing and pulling in different directions. Okay? So this is shown in the trans, so-called transformed system. And sigma 1 and sigma 3 are the non-zero principal stresses. Now, in a 2D case, such as I'm depicting here, there still are three principal stresses. There always are. And they're called sigma 1, 2, and 3. But the definition of a 2D stress state is the third value is 0. So one of the three is always 0. Now, whether or not the zero guy is called sigma 2 or sigma 3 de depends on some conditions. Let's see if I can explain a little bit how the numbering scheme goes. The, the definition that's agreed on is they are ordered in algebraic decreasing value sigma 1 to sigma 3. What does that mean? Largest guy is sigma 1, smallest guy is sigma 3. Sigma 2 is the man in the middle. Okay? Simple as that. Now, in a 2D case of one particular variety, I might have two positive normal stresses, principal stresses, and one zero. I always have one zero. But if the two non-zero happen to both be positive, then I would order them sigma one, sigma one is the largest, sigma two is the other non-zero guy, and sigma three is the zero. Okay? 
So that would be different than this notation. If it happened that I ended up with a sigma 1 that's a large positive value, a, and a 0, and a negative value, which is certainly possible, now I've got sigma 1 and sigma 3, and sigma 2 is the odd man out. Okay? So you will see, actually, I don't have it in the slides, but what I introduced this in, in that section 4.2 or whatever is, I start off using A and B, sigma A and B, to calculate them. That formula may show up here in a moment. But I start off using sigma A and B, and then I look at the numbers. And I, then I stick on the, the 1, 2, and 3, depending upon how they, how they set up from largest to smallest. Okay? These are very uh, minute details, I realize. But this is a complicated enough topic that you need to do the bookkeeping correctly. Otherwise, it's going to get all bollocked up. So these conventions of notation are, are quite important to get the right answer. So to get from one system, my XYZ system, to this other system is essentially a coordinate transformation process. And this just represents that where n hat is the new unit vector sticking out of this, the face that's at this funny angle where the principal stresses happen to live. And that's going to be different for every case. It's just going to be a, sometimes it'll be in your x direction. Other times it'll be in some other direction. So that's my initial stress tensor with the x's and the y's. We multiply by unit vector, n hat, which is normal to the principal plane. And that gives me this transform stress tensor. So this transformation zeroes all the terms but the diagonal. Therefore, I have no shear stress on this plane, this n hat plane, okay? which is what makes those principal normal stresses. So we can also write that equation in this format. This is all sort of a level of detail that perhaps you, you, I'm not expecting you to memorize any of this stuff. But for a background, this is the mathematics. This expression implies that, that the determinant of that matrix, this one, must be 0. So if I set that matrix to 0, and expand it, I get a cubic equation that looks like this. It's sigma cubed minus C2 sigma squared plus C1 sigma minus C0 equals 0. Now, that'll be true if the values of C1 and C2 and C0 are the appropriate numbers, right? So we need to find those. And those turn out to have these values. Now, notice that the values of C1, 2, and 0 are expressed in terms of your applied stresses. Now, we always know the applied stresses. That's where we start. We know the sigma x, the sigma y, the tau xy, the tau yx, all that stuff. Those are going to come out of equations that we will deal with uh, presently. So notice that the only terms in these equations are the applied stresses, the ones that are in my xy domain, which is where I want to be. And I can, once I know what my sigmas and my taus are, I can calculate those three constants. Now, these three constants, sigma 0, 1, and 2, are referred to as invariants, which means just what the word says. They don't change. So it doesn't matter what axis set I start with. You, you choose one x, y, z for a given stress situation. I choose a different x, y, z. If it's the same stress situation, we both end up in the same place, because these coefficients are not different by reason of choice of initial xyz axis system. And the three s ones we're after, these three principal stresses, are the three roots of that cubic equation. And uh, it turns out that those roots, as you probably may recall from your analytic geometry course, and calculus course, a cubic equation can have imaginary roots or complex roots, right, as well as real roots. It turns out that this particular equation never has complex roots. So you'll get three real roots. And it also may surprise you to know that there is a longhand closed form solution for cubic, analogous to the quadratic formula. It's called Viet's method, and it goes back to like 1300 or something like that, or 1400. I, re I reference it in the book, but I don't show it to you. So if you 
take your values of applied stresses, whatever they may be. And in most cases, you'll have a lot of those not there. A lot of them going to be zero, because I'm not going to put all of those on in a given case, right? I'm going to have some subset of those, whatever I have. Put zeros in for the others, do the calculation, stick those numbers in for C0, C1, C2, and plot it. And you will get a cubic that looks like the picture in the upper right. Now, that particular picture is for a 2D stress case. Why? Because sigma 2 is sitting on 0. And if one of those values of sigma 1, 2, or 3 turns out to be 0, ergo, that defines that as a 2D stress case. Right? If all three are non-zero, then I got a 3D stress case. So the roots of that cubic are my principal stresses. So these equations then give me a means of calculating the values of the principal stresses from my givens, my applied stresses. So this is the mathematical route from the set of stresses that you put on this thing, with your pushing and pulling and, and squishing and sliding, right, to a, a function whose roots are the three values in question. And since there is a, a closed form solution to that equation, I don't have to use an iterative solution, which I also could do. So we now have the ability with computers to calculate the principal stresses like that. And one of the things I'm going to assign to you f fairly early on, once you get introduced to some of these programs like TK Solver, is I'm going to tell you, write yourself a TK Solver or a MATLAB or a MathCAD, I don't care, one or the other, routine as a subroutine that you can call and hand it the applied, the six applied stresses and have it hand you back the sigma 1, 2, and 3. And that's going to be a very useful tool because every stress problem you encounter, you want to know what sigma 1, 2, and 3 are. So why keep doing it over and over again? Write a bloody program to do it for you and put the numbers in and push the button. And you'll save yourself a lot of grief. Okay. And here's where I talk about ordering them as sigma 1 is bigger than sigma 2 is bigger than sigma 3. Just what you said. Because that's what I want to compare to the strength of the material, because it's the biggest stress. So typically, I'm going to go after just sigma 1. I'm going to find all three and then say, OK, who's biggest? He's the guy that's going to break this thing, right? So I'm going to compare him to the strength of the material in the same mode. If it's a tensile stress, I compare it to tensile strength, OK? Compressive, compressive shear to shear, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't looked at the shears, but there are principal shear stresses, too, the maximum values. Now, what I just gave you is a, an overly simplistic answer. It's a bit more complicated than that, but I'll let that unravel as we go forward. Okay? So in some very simplistic cases, I could do exactly what I just said and compare the largest principle to the strength of the material and say that ratio is my safety factor. Okay? But we're going to find a better way to do that in a week or two, OK? More universal way to do that. Now, I just mentioned that we also have maximum shear stresses occurring, which are, well, one of these will be the maximum. So these are more properly called the principal shear stresses. And they can be found from the principal normal stresses by these equations, very simple equations. So, so the hard work is solving that cubic. So once I have those, just take the absolute value of the difference between all possible combinations, you know, sigma 1 versus sigma 3, 2 versus 3, and 2 versus 1, right? Take the absolute value of the difference, divide by 2, bingo, I've got the maximum shear. Now, I, remember I said that the, the planes of principal normal stress have zero shear on them. So that means these are in a different direction. They're on different planes. So really, I have to now draw two of these. I got one of these cockeyed somehow or other with the normal sticking out of it, right? And I got another one over here that's cockeyed at a different angle with the maximum shears on it. And there's a picture of that in the book, just in 2D. The angle between this guy and this guy is always 45 degrees. So the maximum shear occurs on planes that are 45 degrees from the maximum normals. Okay? And you can thus look at a broken part. And if you know how it was loaded,
which you don't always know, but if you do, by the angle of the failure plane, you can tell me whether that failed in tension or in shear. I'll more about that later. Everyone clear on this? So, so far, what I've laid down here is, and very briefly showed you some mathematics, it's quite messy, but once, once you get through the mess, it's a cubic equation, which I can solve. And with that cubic equation and some applied stresses, which, by the way, will turn out to be the hardest things to figure out, this is simple, once I have the applied stresses correct. I want to get the, the three principal normals and the three principal shears. And then I go looking at my material strengths. Okay? We'll, we'll do more with them before we actually compare them. This is the, uh, the one in the book that I call sigma A, sigma B. Here it's shown as sigma 1, sigma 3. One of my colleagues made these slides, for which I'm ever grateful, since I didn't have to spend the trouble doing it. <laughs> They're all out of my book. But, but I, didn't, I didn't author these slides. And I would have put A and B there, but that's a detail. Because you don't know in advance which one's going to be 0, right? It could be sigma 1, sigma 2 in a given case. But again, this is just a simplified version of that other ugly mess I showed you with the cubic. I don't need the cubic for the 2D case. I can directly go from the uh, applied stresses, and there are fewer of them now because I'm in 2D, right? I'm missing all the Z stuff. Right to those two guys. And now, what have I got? A quadratic, right? That's a quadratic formula. So I get two answers. One of them is the, I'd call it A and B. And then I decide, throw a zero in there and see where they fall. And, you know, largest to smallest, number them. And the maximum shear stress, this would be tau 1, 3, typically. Certainly, if I had sigma 1 and 3, it'd be tau 1, 3, right? It's found directly from this formula. And I would also write a little routine to do this, because half the time I'm doing 3D and half the time I'm doing 2D. I really don't have to. I could always use the 3D equation. If it's 2D, one of them's going to call it 0. Right? This is just a simplified version of the 3D equation. So what we're looking at here today is how to find the most important stresses, the principal stresses, in a given situation where I have some mixed mode of some shear stresses applied, some tensile stresses applied in this direction, that direction, the other direction. Some are compressive, some are tensile, which just changes the pluses to minuses in here, right? And I can very quickly calculate those numbers. Now, I'm going to do this over again by a very old-fashioned, older than me even, graphical method that I was taught as a young fellow because there were no computers when I was a young fellow. <laughs> And this was the only way you could do it. And it's really a clever, clever system uh, figured out by Mr. Moore a long, long time ago. I don't know the date, but centuries ago, before there were even probably slide rules. So here's, here's a uh, you know, sort of a theoretical stress state. I've got a bunch of 2D again. I've got some taus, and I've got some sigmas being applied in some directions. And here's some numbers. We'll make up some numbers to make an example out of it. This is an actual example in the book, so you don't need to scribble this down uh, madly to try to record it, because you can look at this uh, in the book. Probably example one in chapter four would be my guess. So I'm going to propose that we have a biaxial 2D stress state, stress element, and this is the figure. And I'm going to put a sigma x of 40,000 psi tensile pulling on that surface. And I've got another. Uh, somewhere in here, sigma y of minus 20,000 psi. This is a generic picture, so the, the arrows are all shown going outward, right? But if I had a minus 20,000, those sigma y y's are going inward. They're crushing rather than stretching, yeah? And there's also an applied shear stress. Someone's in there doing this to the tune of 30,000 psi, okay? So that's my combined, this is called a combined stress state. I got more than one flavor of stress. And that's common. And in all cases, I want to reduce it to the standard principle set. Okay. So we draw a pair of axes like so. 
And here's where it starts to get a little flaky. Mr. Moore was a very clever guy. And I'm imagining he said to himself, she said, I know that these stresses, shear and normal, are 45 degrees from one another. But it's kind of hard to plot things on axes that are 45 degrees to one another. You know, the convention is to plot on axes that are 90 degrees to one another. It's just, so what? It's all double the angles. So on a Moore diagram, all the angles are doubled. So that 90 degree angle represents 45 degrees, OK? So that means that the vertical axis on that diagram is going to represent all the shear stresses. They'll show in that direction, either up or down, right? And the normal stresses are always going to appear on the horizontal axis, either going to the left or the right, OK? And the, the, the origin of this is the, you know, inside my stress cube, essentially, what's happening down there. So I have this little footnote. That's right out of the book. And it says, the fact that Moore used the same axes to plot more than one variable is one of the sources of confusion. Now, what is meant by that? Well, I'm going to put the sigma x and the sigma y on that same horizontal axis, which is not what we're used to doing. You know, x goes this way and y goes that way. But this thing is doubled. So 90 is 180. So x is this way and y is that way. Actually, it could be either way, because I have plus or minus x or plus or minus y. So the way to think of it is all the sigmas are on the horizontal, all the tau's are on the vertical. And we'll, we'll unwind that 45 degree arrow when we're all done, OK? We figure the angles out. That's easy. So you can think of it as like doing a transformation to get a picture that makes sense. And we'll undo the transformation when we're done. So I'm going to make the Moore circle now, step by step. And this shows the, the stresses that I have in my particular case here. I have and I have shown the arrows the right way here, too. So I've got the sigma y pushing on the surface. There's got to be a matching one on the other side that I don't show for, for equilibrium. Sigma x is pulling on this surface, and there's a matching one not shown on the other side. And I've got this tau xy, tau yx, and there's a matching one on the back side to give me equilibrium, right? So with the opposite couple. Those just are not shown. So the first thing I do is take any one of these. I'm gonna, I think I'm taking the sigma x, and I write that in the blue arrow. And I make up a scale. You know, one inch equals 10,000 PSI. Pick it, whatever you want. And you literally do these graphically with a ruler. Invent a scale, you know, 10,000 pounds per square inch is an inch. And this is worth four, so that's 40, so that's four inches. That's a little bit big on the scale, but make up your own. And so that's, in my scale, four inches long. This guy's two inches long in the opposite direction for the 20,000 negative, yeah? And now it says I have some shear, and those come in pairs, tau xy, tau yx. So they're a couple, right? And because they're a couple, they have to have a spacing between them. And the spacing between them is the length of these two arrows combined. So my tau show up as a couple this way and that. The last bit happened all of a sudden. So let's talk about what happened. I would then draw this line across from the tips of the outermost arrows and find where that crosses the x-axis and stick my compass point there. Set my compass to the distance from that point to either this side or that side. It doesn't matter which, because it'd be the same, right? It's a diagonal, so it splits this line in two. It splits this line in two. And I draw a circle through the tips of the shears. Where that circle cuts this axis is is sigma 1. It's not so labeled here. And that's sigma 3. And this is 2D, so sigma 2 is at 0. Okay? So this is a graphical way of solving that cubic equation before there were computers to solve it. And it's a very useful way to visualize the stress state We'll, we'll keep coming back to this. Even though we have computers, we can just push the button and get the numbers out. You can't see what's going on unless you do something like this. And looking at the Moore circles tells you a lot about the conditions of the part in that, under that loading. So there are always, always, always three Moore's circles, even for the 2D case. That's important to understand. Because there really always are three principal stresses, sigma 1, 2, and 3, 
In the 2D case, one of them happens to have a value of 0. That does not mean it does not exist. It exists with a value of 0. Okay? And it's going to show up on the axis here. So the, the circle I drew was from uh, sigma 1 to sigma 3. And you could draw another circle from sigma 2 to sigma 1, another one from sigma 2 to sigma 3. Those are the three possibilities, right? So I'm showing all three circles here. Now, how do I find the principal shears? Well, I simply drop a tangent from the circles, the three circles, back to the shear axis. And those are my principal shear values. Now you see why it's the absolute value of the difference between each of those pairs divided by 2. It's the radius of the circle, right? So the shears are each the radii of these circles. Yeah. Now, I can simply observe that this is now my biggest guy, and he happens to be tau 1, 3. That numbering comes from the fact that he connects 1 to 3. Uh, that's the circle he belongs to. 1, 2 is there, and 2, 3 is there. So I would number this sigma 1, this sigma 2, because it is bigger than this algebraically, which is negative. Yes? Everyone clear on that? Yes. Uh, look at how I did this. I, I started by drawing a diagonal from the tips to the tip. And I think you can see how that cuts this line in two. The, the, the light blue plus the dark blue, okay. right? And I, then I stuck my compass point there. And I set my radius to this guy right here, the tip through the circle, where the circle cut the axis is my going to be my principal stresses. Right? Now, I do that for the other two guys, too. right? So I got the three circles. Now I, I told you that the tangents give me the tau 1 threes. Well, maybe I should go back to the formula, which was a couple of slides ago here. Let's see if I can find it. There it is. Uh, this is the formula I was referring to. This told us in the, in the uh, computer solution, I find the taus from these simple formulas, which are just the differences of two uh, principal stresses, the absolute value thereof divided by two, right? If I go back to my more circle thing here, look at tau 1, 3. It's sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2. Sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is the diameter of the circle. Divided by 2 is the radius. That's what I meant by that. So this guy's the radius of this circle. This guy's the radius of that circle. This guy's the radius of that circle. Okay. Now, here's, here's where it gets tricky. And this is to reinforce the idea that you really always have three, even in a 2D case, more circles. And you need to draw them all, always. And this will show you why. I've changed the problem in one very subtle way. The numbers are the same but I remove the minus sign from the 20,000. So now the both normal stresses are positive. So I'm pulling on the y face, pulling on the x face, right? So I start to draw the more circle. I, I just did it. It's all done, OK? And I go through the same rigmajig. I'll walk you through it. I put down the sigma y in either order. Then I put down the sigma x. Then I do the, and I put my shears in as before. I draw the diagonal, take out my compass, set it to the tip of that guy, draw the circle. My circle now is outside the zero on the right, yeah? OK, so if at that point I stopped and I said, OK, that's my largest shear stress, I'd be very wrong. Because I haven't drawn the other two circles. And if I draw the other two circles, I, again, I've got to bisect the lines between them. So I find the, the halfway point between 1 and 3. I set my radius to that. I go boop a boop And I do the same for the 2, 3 little guy over here. And now I do my tangents. And lo and behold, tau 1, 3 is the biggest shear stress. So if I stopped without doing the rightmost panel, I would have a very bad answer. Think I'm safe. And it looks like the difference between uh, tau 1, 3 and tau 1, 2 is probably about 1 and a half to 1 in rough numbers. We are often accepting a 1 and a half safety factor which would mean our strength is one and a half times our stress. And if we use the top one, two, and a one and a half safety factor, we're at failure. 
So you always need to draw the three if on the Mohr circle. So that's the whole story for now. There are three programs, actually two. The third is a note about them. I wrote those programs. Uh, Mohr.exe is a simple uh, program written in Visual Basic, I think it was. And uh, you simply can type in your, you know, whatever you got. Sigma X, Sigma Y, Tau X, Y, whatever. And it will draw the circles for you. So I can invite you to use that as a check on your homework problems, but not to do them with it, OK? I want you to actually draw these circles to get a compass out and do them so you understand how they work. I didn't talk about how we get the angle off the picture. That's, dis that's discussed in the book. It turns out that in, um, in many cases, and I'll tell you what the exceptions are, we really don't care about the angle. If it breaks, do I care if the parts fly off in that direction or that direction? Not really, because it's too late. It broke, right? And that's, that's the difference between the directions of the stresses, where the pieces go after the, after the fact. Now, as long as my material has two properties, it's homogeneous and it's isotropic. Do you remember those from ES 2001? Homogeneous means the same throughout. Isotropic means it has the same strengths in all directions. Luckily, most engineering materials have that property. All the metals, all the non-cast metals, all the wrought metals, by which I mean aluminum, steel, titanium, that are made by rolling, you know, make, make me a rectangle, make me an I-beam or whatever, those tend to be, they're not perfect, they, but they tend to be homogeneous and isotropic. Cast materials, not, because they're particles that are sort of together, uh, and they may, may be less so. Uh, the materials that are really not homogeneous and isotropic are materials like wood, which has a distinct grain. And you know from experience that you can bust a piece of wood very nicely with the grain, but try to do it across the grain, and you probably will fail, right? Depending on how big the piece of wood is. So wood and composite materials in general, because wood is in fact a composite. It's a composite of the fibers that the tree puts out and the lignin that sort of glues them together. So it's really a natural composite material. And uh, artificial composite materials, you know, carbon fiber, uh, fiberglass, bup, 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 all those things, grossly non-homogeneous and non-isotropic. So when you're dealing with those materials, you do care about the direction of the stresses. Because if they're in the wrong way, you're in bigger trouble, right? You want to get them going in the strength direction. But we're not going to deal with composites in this class. Stress 3D is a TKW program which is like the one I just said I want you to write. That solves the 3D stress case and draws the cubic. So again, you can use that to check your work. That's all on your disk. And I, I guess I mentioned this the other day, too, but here it is again. Mech Movie with his amazing stress camera. That's that program I mentioned the other day called MD Solids that's up on all the machines. Um, I think you look for MD Solids in the menu. I think that's what it's under. Give it a try. It's really neat because this stress camera looks inside the pot and shows you the stresses. <laughs> and you can move it around and see them, how they vary. And because we can't visualize stresses, so this sort of does it for you in a very clever way. <laughs>